Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this morning, uh, we start a new series of messages that really will take us up to Thanksgiving. Um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 7. And as we come here to the opening verses of this uh, sermon, Jesus' fame has spread uh, really in a, in a, from about 150 miles out in every direction, from up to Syria, out to Jordan, down to Egypt. And, and the crowds are being brought to him from all of these various regions of the, of the surrounding countries. People who are diseased, who are sick, who are demon-possessed. Um, his fame has spread the previous, the closing verses of chapter 4 tell us so much so that he has reached celebrity status, and the crowds are massive. In these opening verses of our text, Jesus ascends a mountain, and he assumes the posture of a rabbi, the authoritative posture of a rabbi who is going to begin to teach his disciples. Now, we know from other passages, uh, such as Matthew chapter 15, that at occasions like this, uh, Jesus would typically teach for an extended period of time. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 15, when the crowds came to him and Jesus Jesus began to teach and preach. It went on for three solid days. Um, so when we come to the Sermon on the Mount, when you read it, it only takes 10 minutes to read. Um, I, I once had a smart aleck deacon when I was in another denomination. We have no smart aleck deacons in our church, just so you know. Uh, this was in another church. And uh, he said, you know, Jerry, uh, the greatest sermon ever preached was the Sermon on the Mount, and it only took Jesus 10 minutes to do it. And uh, I said, yeah, well, guess what? I ain't Jesus. So there you go. But what he, was, uh, what he was missing out on was the fact that this is not everything that probably that Jesus said. What Matthew has given us is a very well-composed summary or distillation of everything that Jesus said over, in all likelihood, several hours or even several days where these massive crowds have come to hear him. And he's put it together in a very well-done manner. But there's no doubt that, that the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of humanity is the Sermon on the Mount. Thousands, literally thousands of books have been written about this sermon, analyzing and critiquing and digging into it. In fact, there have now been scores, and it's not so much as that, hundreds of books written about the books that have been written about the Sermon on the Mount. There are actually books written for guys like me that critique and say, okay, here are the books you should buy about the Sermon on the Mount. That's how many books and how important this sermon is. One of the first known books that we have in existence about the Sermon on the Mount is a commentary by St. Augustine, written in the, the early 400s. And the very first sentence of his book helps explain the importance of the Sermon on the Mount. This is what he says. He says, If anyone will piously and soberly consider the sermon which our Lord Jesus Christ spoke on the Mount, I think that he will find in it a perfect standard of the Christian Christian life. And this we do not rashly venture to promise, but gather it from the very words of the Lord himself. The standards of the Christian life. In fact, that last sentence kind of gives us a clue as to why this sermon is so important. It comes from the very mouth of the Lord Jesus himself. This sermon encapsulates Jesus' theology, his doctrine, his gospel of the kingdom is right here. And what you'll see throughout the gospels is that this message, the Sermon on the Mount, it is sprinkled in other places because he's an itinerant preacher. And as he speaks in other locations to other audiences, Jesus will repeat aspects of the Sermon on the Mount when he's in other places throughout his, his ministry. But even if you don't understand it from that perspective, all you have to do to understand the importance of the Sermon on the Mount and its greatness is simply read it. 
Every time I read the Sermon on the Mount, it just slays me. It slays me. Um, you, you read this sermon, and it just strikes you to the marrow of your soul. Dr. Kent Hughes calls it a spiritual x-ray machine. He says, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, it undresses you. No one can read it and walk away from it unaffected and unscathed and unconvicted because it reveals what's going on deep inside of our lives and our hearts. It undresses us spiritually. It makes us uncomfortable. Because when you read it, you realize there's no way I measure up to this. How far short I fall from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it's because of this that through the centuries, there have been those who have taught that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, um, he never intended for us to literally follow it and obey it. And that wasn't his purpose. Uh, different groups, different individuals have packaged this in different ways and for different reasons and with different ideas. For example, uh, some have said that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is actually making the law of Moses so onerous, um, so hard, that he is coming across like Moses on steroids, right? That it's so hard that it's intentional in order to drive us to the gospel, Right? Um, others have said, especially uh, in the last hundred years or so, as, as, the, as liberal theology has crept into uh, Christianity and evangelical Christianity, the, these folks have said, that, listen, Jesus clearly does not mean meant to be taken literally. Just look at the language he uses. He uses uh, proverbs and maxims and hyperbole and exaggerated types of statements and paradoxes that, that can contradict themselves or contradict other aspects of the scriptures. He, he clearly does not mean to be taken literally. What he wants you to do is he wants you to get to the spirit of the Sermon on the Mount. And so when you get to the spirit of the Sermon on the Mount, those who are into the social gospel, for example, will say that Jesus is, is, is really wanting us to take what he says in the spirit of it and build a better society and build a better world and, and that type of thing. And those who are all about the therapeutic gospel, they see Dr. Sigmund Jesus in this sermon and they want us to have a better psychological well-being and emotional health. And the prosperity gospel comes to it and they see the spirit of it that Jesus wants us to be wealthy and healthy. And, and so everyone takes the spirit of it and massages it in a way that, you know, con is convenient and, and different. I, I was raised in a tradition, frankly, um, that taught uh, both the churches that I was raised in, the college, the university, the, the seminary that I went to, got my degree from, taught that the Sermon on the Mount is not for the New Testament church, not at all. Um, they, they read it and said, no, what's going on here is Jesus is talking to the Jews. He's offering the kingdom to the nation of Israel. That, that in that dispensation of the law, people had their righteousness come to them through obedience to the law. And they, uh, they, did, they rejected Jesus. But Jesus was offering the kingdom to them, and this was the society that he would establish if they would simply accept him. This, this beautiful society where the law would reign, and this would be the environment that would be there. But they ultimately reject him, and so he turns his attention to the church. And later, he would come back to Israel, the nation of Israel. And we talked about this some last week, and some of you thought that I might have, you know, been on some meds or something. And uh, so just to prove this to you, I pulled out my old Schofield Reference Bible. <clears throat> How many of you used to own a Schofield Reference Bible? Raise your hand. If you don't know what a Schofield Reference Bible is, that this is uh, this was like the, the I think maybe the first really uh, popular study Bible 
created and in the United States, and it reigned supreme uh, from the early 1900s until maybe recently, uh, maybe the, the, the late 1900s. And it comes from a, what is known as dispensationalism, as a, a theological system that uh, was very prominent within evangelical Christianity. And many of you, some of you have been raised in that. But and in the notes to the Schofield Reference Bible, which many of us were raised with, who, who were uh, Christians in that, in that faith tradition, this is what it says. <clears throat> For these reasons, the Sermon on the Mount, in its primary application, gives neither the privilege nor the duty to the church. These are found in the epistles. Under the law of the kingdom, for example, no one may hope for forgiveness who is not first forgiven. Matthew chapter 6 in Jesus' sermon. Under grace, the Christian, that's what we live under, is exhorted to forgive because he is already forgiven, Ephesians 4. So in other words, there's a difference for forgiveness under the law of the kingdom versus under the age of grace. And he goes on and says, but there is a beautiful moral application to the Christian for the Sermon on the Mount. It always remains true that the poor in spirit rather than the proud are blessed. So in other words, the Sermon on the Mount is not for us, that's for the other groups. We can take some moral lessons from it, just like you can from the Old Testament. You can get some moral truths, kind of like you do from Aesop's fables. But they're not for the church. They're for the nation of Israel. And that's how they responded to these things. Well, listen, I got news for you. The Sermon on the Mount, every word of it, is as much for us as it was for the early church and for that original audience. Every word of it is for us, and we are going to be spending large parts of this ministry year studying major portions of the Sermon on the Mount, line upon line, precept upon precept. And we're going to start this morning with the Beatitudes, the beautiful attitudes that characterize the citizens of Jesus's kingdom. The Beatitudes. Um, there's, there's eight of them. You know, there's, there's in, if you go to the book of Galatians, there are nine fruits of the Spirit. And, and all nine of those fruits of the Spirit are supposed to be in existence and in some way, whether a little bit or a large bit, characterizing the life of a, of a believer of Jesus Christ. There are eight Beatitudes, and all eight of these Beatitudes are supposed to be characterizing the life of someone who is a citizen of Jesus' kingdom. Now, if you want a rough outline of them, the first four describe our attitude towards God. The second four describe our attitude towards other people. And if this is the most important sermon ever preached then the first sentence, which is the first beatitude, I would contend, is the most important sentence in the most important sermon ever preached. It sets the foundation for everything that follows in the Sermon on the Mount. The reason why people come to the Sermon on the Mount and they, they say, oh, this is all about the law and not gospel is because they miss the first beatitude. The first beatitude sets the foundation for the gospel. And that the Be Sermon on the Mount is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. So let's read it together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One more time, say it out loud. Blessed So this morning, with our remaining time, we're going to do several things. We're going to answer several questions. What is the meaning of blessed? Okay. We need to know what the meaning of blessed is because all of the Beatitudes have that word starting it. We need to know what the meaning of poor in spirit is. And then we need to know what this all means for us in relationship to the kingdom of heaven. Now that word blessed, the meaning of it comes from the Greek word makarios. Okay, and every time I hear the word Macarius, for some reason, I want to sing, you know, Ma Macarena. Okay, but anyway, uh, um, the, uh, 
and that's where that ends, okay? Uh, <laughs> But there's kind of a good relationship there because that is a happy song, right? You just can't help but tap your feet whenever you hear the Macarena, right? And that's what the word Macarena means. It means happy. And so when you, uh, some of your translations might say, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But folks, Jesus is not uh, advocating an emotional uh, state here, okay? <clears throat> He's not. He's not talking about an emotional uh, condition. He is talking about a state of being. And a better understanding of blessed, of Macarius in this context, is the idea of being a privileged recipient of divine favor. Privileged recipient of divine favor. That's the definition of Macarius in this type of a context. In other words, two words. Write down two words. God favored. God favored favored. Listen, if you are God favored, you are living in a state of blessedness. I mean, it doesn't get any better in your life than to be favored by God, right? I mean, if you're favored by God, thumbs up, right? If you're not favored by God, thumbs down. So God favored. When you're God favored, um, there are going to be, certainly going to be times in your life where externally it's going to be very obvious. And this is why people who are into the prosperity gospel will say, yeah, you're going to be rich. You're going to be, and, and, it, and it's true that when you are God-favored, he certainly takes care of your physical needs. And these types of things do occur. But listen, there are also times when you go through times of trial and tribulation and you may not have uh, a prosperity and, and things aren't always going well for people physically, whether it, when it comes financially or with your physical health or uh, emotional well, whatever. But yet, when you are God-favored, there is an internal state of contentment and strength and peace and joy that sustains you even through those times when maybe materially there is an abundance. So God favored and being blessed is important. Understand how important this is. God approves, right? Those who God approves, who experience God's blessings, are poor in spirit. There's a causality here. There's a linkage here. And this is true of all of the Beatitudes. If, if you want God's approval, the Beatitudes are for you. People who have this character, these characteristics in their life, they enjoy God's approval. Okay? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So what does the phrase poor in spirit mean? <clears throat> now at this point we need to remember something. Jesus is speaking in Aramaic. That was the common language of his day that the Jews spoke. Matthew is writing several decades later in Greek, which was the common language of the Mediterranean world. It was a language of commerce like English is today. And we're reading it in English. <laughs> okay, so we read the English word poor. Jesus was communicating a concept, poor in spirit. That is the way we have it in English. Matthew is writing it in Greek. The, the Greek language had several words for our one English word, poor. For example, in the New Testament, you will read the English word poor, and it might be the word, Greek word panes. Panes means that you work, you had a job, you just didn't make a lot of money. <clears throat> you were the working poor. You were, you were like, maybe you were like my family growing up. Your, your dad worked two jobs. Your mom worked a job. When we were in fifth or sixth grade, by that time, we were all working uh, jobs and had lawn businesses, and we all pulled our money, and we put it towards the welfare of the family, right? Uh, we ate out a couple of times a year, and one of the restaurants, there's a chain in Jacksonville at that time, still is in existence, is unique to Jacksonville, called Famous Amos. And it was a country restaurant, and uh, its logo was uh, poor but proud. And, and all the meals were cheap. 
right? And that's, and, and if you were poor, you went to famous Amos. And, it, and by the way, by, and even though it was poor, but proud, the food was phenomenal. It's great country cooked food, if you want good country cooking. Uh, phenomenal food, but it is for the poor people in Jacksonville. And that's where we went. And, and they were always filled, by the way. <laughs> always a lot, of people, a lot of customers at famous Amos. And that's Panace. You know, you had a roof over your head. You know, you, you, you had food and you, you had clothes. They weren't designer and they may have rips and they had patches. And, but at, at least you weren't starving to death. But that's not the word that Jesus uses here or that Matthew uses here to describe what Jesus is talking about. It, it's the Greek word tokos. And the word tokos it, it comes from a root word, another word that means to crouch in fear, to cringe in, in, in anxiety. It's the idea of someone who was utterly destitute and beggarly, who was totally dependent upon other people for survival, for existence. It's the idea that was associated with Lazarus. Remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? He, he had to beg for the table scraps from the rich man's table to survive. And when he didn't have enough food, he ultimately gets, he dies. His entire existence is dependent upon other people, and he has to beg, and he has to put up with the abuse of other people who don't want him around, and their violence, and their attitudes, and he cringes. This is tokos. This is poor in spirit. Now, why would Jesus choose this concept for these folks? And why would he start the Beatitudes in this way? Well, again, remember who he's speaking to. He's speaking to Hebrews. And in the, they, in the Old Testament, in their familiarity with the Old Testament, there is this concept already established in the Old Testament. When you go, for example, to Psalm chapter 70, verse 5, you hear King David say, But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Now, now who's speaking here? Who did I say was speaking? King David, which made him what? Rich, right? So you could be rich, yet be poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. So being poor in spirit is not necessarily mean that you don't have financial abundance, it is a state of being. It is a mindset. It is dependent upon your heart attitude and what's going on in your life. God will say in Isaiah chapter 57, <clears throat> thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So this is what poor in spirit is getting at. And so you have to ask the question, why does Jesus start here with tokos, with poor in spirit? What is, what is he getting at with these people who have come from all around to listen to him? Why is he starting with this idea? Remember last week, the kingdom concepts? He's talking to Hebrews, to Jews, they were God's chosen people. They're expecting the kingdom. They're expecting the warrior king, the Messiah, to kick everyone out. The Gentiles, the Romans, they're all dogs. And their mindset is, of course we're citizens of the kingdom of God. We're Jews, aren't we? We're children of Abraham, aren't we? We're circumcised on the eighth day, aren't we? Uh, the, the dogs aren't part of the kingdom. We're part of the kingdom because of who we are. This arrogance, this pride, this racism, this ethnic and religious discrimination and bigotry that was inherent within the country, they had missed it even from their own prophets and what their, their, the kingdom of God had degenerated into from a spiritual worldwide kingdom had become this political idealism. And God starts right there, attacking the root of arrogance and pride, personified with the Pharisees, but understand it was rampant throughout the society. We're better than everyone else. 
Now, of course, we don't need that message today at all, do we? Not at all. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does this mean for us, especially relative to the kingdom of God? Um, John Stott explains it like this. I love John Stott. He's one of the great minds of our age. He says, to be poor in spirit is to acknowledge our spiritual poverty, indeed our spiritual bankruptcy before God. For we are sinners under the holy wrath of God, deserving nothing but the judgment of God. Read this last sentence with me out loud. We have nothing to offer, nothing to plead, nothing with which to buy the favor of heaven. That's poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven, folks, it belongs to those who are continually acknowledging their inherent spiritual poverty and destitution. The kingdom of heaven is made for people who are continually saying, I am tokos. I am utterly dependent upon my Lord Jesus Christ for my existence, for my survival, for my strength, for my sustenance, for my victory, for any blessing, for any type of, of challenge, any type of victory over sin I have. It all comes from him. We read earlier, or, or Paxson read earlier, to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God, and this was the gospel he pointed out, it is God who gives us the desire, the will, and the ability to do that very work of sanctification. It all comes from him. He's the fountainhead, the spring of everything that we can do in the Christian life. It's the foundation. It all comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It inherently comes from him because inherently we are broken and corrupted. And those who experience God's blessing, who are God approved, are those who first realize they are spiritually utterly destitute. Those who believe in the deepest part of their souls that they have no advantage over anyone else regardless of, of education or economic abilities or skin color or denomination or heritage or whatever. Those who believe that they cannot save themselves that they don't deserve God's mercy, that at the end of the day, they are not righteous apart from Jesus Christ. That when they look at themselves apart from what Jesus does, they say, I am not good. <laughs> if Jesus doesn't intervene in my life, I will run after sin every chance I get. And the only reason why I don't is because Jesus works in my life. That person is the person who God approves of. Now listen, the world's message is diametrically opposite of this, right? It's not the poor in spirit, the person who is humble, who says, I am spiritually destitute, I am utterly dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his spirit. Not at all. The world's message is, blessed are the rich. Blessed are the rich, for they shall have the good life. Blessed are the strong and the powerful, for they shall be secure. Blessed are the strong, for they're the ones who will be free from fear. Blessed are the self-sufficient, for they shall control their own destinies. You see, that's the message of the kingdom of this world. You're, you can only trust yourself, and it's up to you, but that's okay, because you are inherently, I mean, you have that spark of divine. I mean, you are God yourself. You are the end. You're the judge. You're the one who should look to yourself, right? You're the end standard. Your truth, what you think is truth, what I think is truth. That's what the kingdom of our world pushes upon us. But Jesus says, No. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He gives us an illustration of this in the New Testament. He gives us two different guys. One is very religious, dressed very well. He's a Pharisee. He's a very moral person. You'd want him to marry your daughters, probably. He was, no doubt, 
fairly financially well off. He was a moral dude. And he goes to the temple and he begins to pray. And he throws his arms out and he looks up to heaven and he begins to say, Look, God, thank you for not making me like that tax collector over there. Thank you that I don't sin like him. Thank you for all the advantages. And aren't you lucky that you have me on your team? You know? And he begins to list his curriculum vitae and all the benefits that he brings to God and to the kingdom and how good he is and how much he does for God and how much better he is than the person over there, the tax collector. And then there's the tax collector. He won't even look up at God. And he says, God, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve your mercy. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And how does Jesus end this story? He says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, the dog, the unclean person in their society, the lowest of the low, the collaborator with the enemy, I tell you, this collaborator, this lowest of the low, this man went down to his house justified, made right with God, God approved. This man went down to his house, God approved and declared righteous. That's what it means. Rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Which of those men would you rather be? God approved or the other? As we close this out, let me apply it by applying uh, Close it out by applying it to two different groups this morning. Some of us this morning, I have no doubt, are not a part of the kingdom of God. And you may know this or you may not know this. I'm amazed by the folks who oftentimes may not know that they're not a part of the kingdom of God. I remember when I was a child, um, uh, maybe in junior, close to being in junior high, I was part of a mega church in Jacksonville. That, and this was in the days before they had the word mega church. <laughs> and the pastor preached a sermon in, uh, one night, and he and he offered people the opportunity to come forward as our our tradition did, and and receive Christ. And a lady got out of the choir, and she walked down uh, out of the choir, and and there was a ripple through the church, and she came forward, and uh, she ultimately makes a profession of faith to receive Christ. And the reason why it made a ripple was it was the pastor's wife. And, uh, you know, and she's uh, middle-aged by this point and has been a pastor's wife for gosh, 25, 30 years. Um, and he shared with the church her words that she whispered in his ears. She said, <laughs> she was a neat lady. She says, I'm not going to hell to protect your reputation as the pastor of this church. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she said, you know, I've been convicted for a long time. She knew all the right answers. She knew her Bible backwards and forwards. She had all the doctrine and the theology right in her mind. She'd been raised in child. She was a professional Christian. How many professional Christians will split hell wide open? That number's going to be staggering. Never a member of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because there's no conviction in the heart of destitution and spiritual poverty. I would ask you this morning, do you believe in your heart that you are spiritually bankrupt without Jesus Christ? That you are spiritually poor do you believe in your heart that apart from Jesus Christ, you are not a good person? By God's standards, not a righteous person. And whether you're a professional Christian or someone who's on the fence or anything else, if in your heart you think in some way, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a 
good person or yeah, yeah, I'm a, I got news for you. You're like Mrs. Gray. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Pray that God would give you a heart to see your utter need for Jesus Christ, your utter destitution and dependence upon God's mercy, that we fall far short of the glory of God, that we are born bankrupt sinners, deserving no mercy, deserving no grace, and that on our very best days, without Jesus Christ, our very best days are infinitely evil in God's eyes. Our motives are corrupted. They're selfish. They're vainglorious. Our best days condemn us, my friends. And if you're here and you've never committed your life to Christ, You've never come to the point of confessing, I am a sinner and I need Jesus to rescue me from my sin. May today be that day where you give your life to Christ. Those who don't have Jesus need this message, but those who know Jesus and follow him need this message because just as we come into the kingdom by confessing our kingdom poverty, our spiritual vitality depends on us continually confessing that vitality. If you're, if you're a Christian and you're struggling with your vitality and your energy, if your Christian life is just, eh, you know, how are you doing with your Christian life? Eh. May I suggest that the issue comes right back to this first beatitude, the confession of our kingdom poverty. In, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says this to the church of Laodicea, I know your works are neither cold nor hot, in other words, hey, Laodicea, how's your spiritual walk? Eh, it's okay. It's been better. It's all right. It's good. It's fine. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm, eh, and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. How did they get lukewarm? For you say, I am rich. I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They had walked away from this very first beatitude, and it is foundational to the gospel and to our thriving as a Christian. Christian, this morning, if that's you, I want to encourage you, come before Jesus. Come before Jesus. Paxson made mention of a song, when I find myself in this state, and listen, I find myself in this state, and I find myself relying upon myself, and when I do, it gets me in nothing but trouble. And, and I, but I find that when I am mean, like this, when I come before Jesus, and I, I confess, and I sing, sometimes I sing, and music is a part of my spiritual journey, and one of the songs that recently, over the last several years, we sing it in our church. And when I'm, eh, this is a song that I sing to God. Not very well, but I sing it. Here's the lyrics from Matt Marr. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Here's a, maybe the verse I like the most. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. To teach my song to rise to you. 
when temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you, Jesus. You're my hope and stay. Lord Jesus, that is so true for each and every one of us here. There are some here, Lord, who are professional Christians or who have never confessed you. You are their hope and stay. May right now, even as I pray, may they pray. In fact, if you're here this morning and and this message has touched your heart, and you would say, Jerry, I am that professional Christian. Jerry, I am that person who's never committed to my life to Christ. I'm just going to stop right now, and I want to lead you in a prayer. And if the intention and desire of your heart is you would like to give your life to Christ, I, I want to just give you a simple prayer to pray with me. It's the, the magic isn't in the words of my prayer. It's in the intention of your heart. So pray with me in the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have no hope in myself. I have no hope apart from you. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for them. I believe you rose from the dead for me. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, and my King. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that with me this morning, I hope that at the close of the service, you'll come see me. And that we'll rejoice together that you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Lord Jesus, be with us this morning. Those of us who are struggling in our Christian walk, may we know that we need you. May we come to you. May we fall at your feet and we find the grace, the sustaining power that can only be found there so that we can be those citizens of the kingdom that bring glory to you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.